I am John Lorsch, Director of the National Institute of General Medical Sciences, and I want to welcome you to the DeWitt Stetton Jr. Lecture. For those of you who don't know who DeWitt Stetton Jr. was, he spent most of his career here at NIH. He was um, at two institutes and in the office of the director. He's perhaps best known as the NIH Deputy Director for Science, so the equivalent of Mike Gottesman now. Uh, but before that, he served as the third director of NIGMS, which is why we have named this lectures uh, after him. In recognition of his many contributions to NIH and to the outside community, he has the rare distinction, actually, of having two NIH entities named after him, this lecture, and also the DeWitt Stetton Jr. Museum of Medical Research. So today's speaker uh, is definitely very worthy of giving this uh, well-named lecture. Alejandro Sanchez Alvarado joins us um, as a, one of a very long and distinguished list of Stetton lecturers. He's made major contributions to understanding the genetic and molecular basis of regeneration. Many of his studies have been conducted in the flatworm planarian. And the uh, planarian, as many of you know, has the remarkable ability to re uh, regenerate itself entirely, almost, even from a single scrap of tissue. Alejandro has studied and really pioneered uh, work in planarians for 20 years. He sequenced the, wor sequenced the worm's genome and has used and actually developed a wide variety of approaches to search for the specific cells to allow regeneration to occur, occur from even very small pieces of the animal. And I, he'll tell you about that work today. Alejandro was born and raised in Caracas, Venezuela, and received his BS in molecular biology and chemistry from Vanderbilt University and his PhD in pharmacology and cell biophysics from the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. He's currently an HHMI investigator in the Department of Developmental Genetics and Cell Biology at the Stowers Institute for Medical Research in Kansas City. In addition to his many research accomplishments, he's also committed to inspiring the next generation of scientists. Together with his colleague, Elise Accorsi, he has created an educational product, a, um, project for middle and high school students that includes hands-on classroom activities for exploring regeneration and stem cell biology. I'm pleased to say that we have supported him since 1998 and continue to do so. And now, without any further ado, Alejandro. Hello and uh, good afternoon. And uh, thank you very much, uh, John, for a very kind uh, introduction. And thank you all for being here today. Um, this is a, a really a meaningful um, um, presentation for me. As, I, as John mentioned to you, I've been uh, funded by NIGMS uh, since I started my laboratory. And uh, I owe a great deal of what I'm going to tell to you today to that initial funding that has allowed me to really uh, explore the possibility of uh, identifying a system and work out a system in which to dissect the molecular and cellular basis of regeneration. So what I thought I would do today, essentially, is just divide my presentation into three parts. The first one is going to be about perspective, just to give you a, a, a framework for why we are thinking about the problem the way we're thinking about it. The second one is the way we have chosen to think about trying to solve this problem. And the third part will be about the more recent uh, results that have uh, arisen as a consequence of the first two things that I'm going to tell you about. So I'm going to start from uh, the very beginning, because it's very important for us uh, to uh, understand you know, where we all come from. And one of the major issues associated with um, our understanding of biological processes, particularly developmental biology, is that there's an immense diversity of animals. And I'm going to leave the plants out for now, but animals that um, appear to have shared common ancestry, and which we don't understand how, from that common ancestry, they have actually developed this immense number of biological attributes and characteristics that we wish we could understand. So the problem about the origin of metazoans can be split into two specific things. The first one is that we really don't know what was possible. So if we look retrospectively, we look into the past, what we know about the past uh, forms of life that inhabited this planet come essentially from a very scant collection of fossils. And this is essentially the history of anything that could fossilize, which are essentially organisms that will have an exoskeleton or some calcareal structures that will actually mineralize. 
But for soft-blooded organisms, we have essentially no um, verifiable uh, fossil record or uncontroversial, I, I should say, uh, fossil record. So what do I mean by this? What that means essentially is that we really don't know when bilateral symmetry, when uh, multicellularity may have really taken hold on the face of this planet uh, and, and, and where. Okay? So if you look at um, a geological distribution of, um, of uh, the history of life in this planet based on the fossils that we have, Many people would argue that the, origin of, the origins of multicellularity may have arisen sometime around 600 to 700 million years ago, okay? Um, and that's because that's as far as the fossil record of multicellular organisms arise. Now, people began to look at uh, these particular structures from phosphorus mines, which are being used to produce all the electronics that we use today, and they found structures that were really hard to explain on mere geological characteristics, and they found something that looks really like a uh, very early metazoan embryo with multiple blastomeres attached in a little, uh, in a little sphere, and they call that organism a megasphere. And uh, megasphere uh, is a purportedly an animal fossil that dates all the way back to approximately 750 million years ago. So there's all kinds of controversies associated with this because it could still be a geological issue, it may not necessarily be the fossil record of a, um, of a uh, soft-bodied uh, organism, but the fact is that these things exist, okay? If you now take another approach, which is, well, let's just not guess. Why don't we use known rates of mutagenesis and then calculate the earliest time based on those rates of mutagenesis when these multicellular organisms may have arisen? And so this is called molecular clocks, which has all kinds of caveats, okay? I mean, I, I'm not uh, advocating for them as being infallible, but people do these exercises and they do this uh, uh, bioinformatic analysis. And again, when you do these studies and you look at the distribution of extant phyla from sponges all the way to uh, 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 echinoderms or, or, or the lineage that gives rise to the vertebrates, and you look at all these different uh, numbers here, these are millions of years ago when the molecular clock suggests that this particular phyla may have arisen. And multicellularity appears to have appeared sometime around 653 or 700 million years ago. So that pushes the, the, uh, the, uh, the clock back in respect to what we have for fossil record. Now, the reason why people don't believe this is because if you now cross-reference this information with the geology of our planet, what you find out very quickly is that all of these multicellular organisms existed at a time when Earth was a snowball. It's referred to as snowball Earth, completely covered in ice, very likely inhospitable and inhabitable. And therefore, people suggest that the only life forms that could have existed then were very simple life forms like bacteria, uh, archaea, and, and, and methanogens, and so forth, okay? Methanotrophs, and so forth. And so, what you see essentially here is that um, this, sorry, let me go back, that this particular um, uh, activity is highly unlikely to have been present somewhere in the Carogenian or Snowball Earth, okay? Now, earlier this year, there was a publication in PNAS that suggested that the, it might be correct. And again, it's controversial, but still, you know, it's being uh, considered by scientists. And it's this microfossil. This microfossil comes from the western arch of Australia. It's one of the oldest land masses on the planet. Geologically, it dates back to about three and a half to four billion years ago. And they found microfossils. Now, just think about this. Our planet is about four, four and a half billion years old. The fact that they could find a microfossil that is this complex, uh, dating all the way back to approximately three and a half to four billion years ago, suggests that maybe life has been trying to um, um, establish itself on this planet from day one. And maybe what we have seen in the record is multiple attempts for complex life to emerge. That there may not have been one beginning, but multiple beginnings that fail, attempted again, fail, attempted again, and now we have all these extant species. Now, clearly, this is really, really difficult to prove, right? And it's also very difficult to disprove because you, we don't have a time machine. We cannot go back in time and say, oh yeah, that's what it was. And so problem solved, right? And so here's the problem, is that because, you know, we have this very scant fossil record, we may never know what was possible out there. So what we have left is the life forms that we have uh, covering the planet at the present time. And so brings me to the second part about the origin of metazoans, which is, or the diversity of metazoans, is that I'm going to posit to you the following thesis, which is that we do not know what is possible. We think we do, but we don't really know what is possible. And so I'm just going to give you a couple of examples about what I mean by this. So take, for example, um, what we have done for the past, you know, um, tw the 20th century. 
we have decided to take the biomedical sciences and life sciences enterprise to focus on a few organisms that we could domesticate, bring into the lab, and then subject to very intensive interrogation and high granularity uh, levels of analysis to understand the you know, mechanistic underpinnings of the biology we're interested in understanding. And so what we see here are you know, the five uh, major organisms that uh, the NIH and other funding agencies around the world have decided to invest their resources in. And I'm not saying that this has been a waste of time because it's not. In fact, these are absolutely necessary for us to really make uh, inroads in understanding the complexity of, of life forms. But they're all vertebrates, you know, includes us, you know, there's mice and frogs and chicks and, and zebrafish. And then, of course, we have two invertebrates that are the workhorses of, uh, of genetics and developmental biology, which are Drosophila and C. elegans, of course, okay? Now, when you look at this and, um, and you think about um, what these organisms have taught us, it's immense. We have invested a huge amount of time and we have learned a great deal of information, but we have selected a very small number of animals to do so. And there was a logic for doing that. So what I would like to do is illustrate why this actually might begin to uh, impinge upon our ability to interrogate nature by limiting our ability to really go out there and maybe try to discover new uh, biology. And I'm gonna do that not with a multicellular organism, I'm gonna do that with a protist. In this case, tetrahymena. Everybody here has probably seen tetrahymena, maybe work with tetrahymena. It's a very famous unicellular cilia uh, that is usually considered to be microscopic, 40 to 48 microns uh, in diameter. And what we learned from a unicellular organism in the, in, in the years that we study this organism ha has been really astonishing. We know that ribosomes were discovered here by Alman and Czech, received a Nobel Prize in, in 1989. We know that telomeres were also discovered in, in tetrahymena, a unicellular protist, okay, not even closely related or resembling anything uh, like us. Uh, we also know that the first molecular motor was identified in, in, in this organism, in this case, dynase. And we also know that these epigenetic marks that are all the rage right now were first discovered in histone H3, K4 trimethylation in this particular organism by David Alice and, and, and colleagues. What is really astonishing to me, which is not really what I see in, in, in present day, is that each and every one of these discoveries were all funded by the NIH. They were all our ones. Most of them, if not all of them, were from NIGMS. Okay, so it's, it's really remarkable to see how much the pendulum has shifted towards not trying to fund these kinds of things and focusing on other things that are important, but they're really not the, the entirety of what we really should be focusing on. Because what we stand to gain is, is, is immense, and we just don't have an appreciation for how immense it is. Now, you think that, okay, if a protist can produce this much knowledge and this is all we have, then we know everything there is to know about protists. But we don't even know what the genotypic and phenotypic space these organisms occupy, and how much more biology there is in this particular protist. I'm gonna give you one example. This thing right here, which is known as Syringamina fragilissima, is about 20 centimeters in size. It is a protist. It's a unicellular organism. This is a change in the scale of approximately 25,000 fold. Now think about this. A unicellular organism can occupy space that ranges from the microscopic to the visible with the naked eye. That's the genotypic, phenotypic space that a single cell species or types of organisms actually occupy. If you extrapolate that to all the other diversity of organisms that are out there, it should really boggle your mind. And so it boggles mind, that's for sure. And so what we have now is the following situation. We have a situation where the vast majority of the uh, research organisms that we are utilizing in our labs today essentially are derived from one particular phylum, which are the vertebrates right here. So these are the five that I showed you earlier. And then we think, well, we have enough invertebrates, so you should just study those. But it turned out that even though they were selected as being different, they actually belong to the same phylogenetic clade, which are the so-called like Dysozoa, which are Drosophila and C. elegans. So we're talking essentially about three phyla out of approximately 29, and now there's 31 different phyla. If you now believe the last um, inventory of uh, animals that, uh, that was executed a couple of years ago, putting forward somewhere in the order of about nine to 10 million species out there, these organisms represent a total of nine times 10 to the minus 5% of all organisms in the planet. The question, statistically speaking, is what are the odds that everything that we need to understand about biology will be encompassed by nine times 10 to the minus 5% of our organisms? It's essentially zero. So the amount of information that we are ignoring and we're choosing to ignore for whatever reasons is immense. It's in fact probably much bigger than anything we have learned so far. 
So I think it would behoove us to try to start looking at what is it that we don't know? And just do the experiment. If it turns out that we know a lot, great. You know, we pat our shoulders, we did a great job. But if it turns out we're missing a lot of information, then we need to get to work and start to really gather that information and begin to include those factors in what we think we understand about biological processes, many of them which are associated, of course, with things that we really uh, worry about. OK. If you now look at this tree of life, what you see essentially is that there's a large group of organisms in the middle, which are a mouthful to pronounce, the so-called Lophotrogozoa, uh, that essentially are not really broadly represented in um, uh, biomedical uh, and life sciences laboratories across the globe. And unfortunately, these animals are primarily, almost all of them, soft-bodied animals. And they also encompass the largest collections of body plants we have, and about 50% of all extant multicellular organisms, and we know nothing about that. If you look at the tree, it shares common ancestor, uh, ancestry sorry, with us, and it shares common ancestry with the Dysozoa. So there's an entire branch of your family tree that we know anything about, very little about. So I think that really needs to be uh, uh, corrected somehow. All right. So the usual argument that people throw me uh, uh, throw at my face is that, well, you know, it's, just, it's just not really practical. I mean, you're not really going to get anything out of working with these very complicated animals because we have a really, really high resolution and high granularity with all the tools we've developed in the past 50 years with the systems that we are working on. Drosophila and C. elegans, I salivate when I see the genetic, you know, hoops that these, uh, these organisms can, can actually go through. Uh, and then they suggest that, you know, you get high resolution with these established so-called model systems. And you know, with these unestablished or really poor non-model systems, as they call them, very low resolution. Remains phenomenological. You cannot learn anything about them. But there's another way to think about this problem, which is that rather than pitting them against each other, uh, the, you know, the model versus the non-model organisms, I mean, I like to think that you can look at it this way. It's that when you look at these established organisms, you're essentially mapping what's already been discovered. These are already discovered continents versus discovering entirely new continents. And I think that's what's really awaiting for us. If we have the opportunity and we have the guts to actually go out there and start looking for this new biology, because it's very likely going to be there. So that's not really a, uh, a bad bet to, to make. OK. So given that there is a very high likelihood that there's a great deal of biology out there that we don't understand, and that those organisms are not going to come with their toolkit already preassembled for you, it's not like you can pick up the phone and call for clones or something. Uh, you're going to have to think of a way in which you can accelerate the process by which you can bring those students or those, those uh, organisms to a level of, um, of interrogation and resolution that will be satisfactory for us to understand mechanistic underpinnings of, of this biology. So I'm just going to give you um, a, a, a way in which we like to think about the problem of regeneration, which is what we're going to be talking about as, as, a, as one of the last frontiers, uh, unexplored frontiers of developmental biology, is that the organisms that have been used for studying regeneration they're not really the ones that you think about being really the most accessible and the ones possessing the most sophisticated tools. Actually, quite the contrary. And so one way to think about this is that, you know, well, if you know everything that there is to be known about the organism, maybe you can actually come up with the right strategies and the right methodologies to interrogate the biology. And I like to use the Pythagorean theorem. I know it's, it's 3 in the afternoon and after lunch. But I like to use the Pythagorean theorem because this theorem has been solved at least 3,000 different ways. Okay? And Almost every single one of them requires a great deal of knowledge about arithmetic, about measures, about geometry, and uh, other disciplines of, of math. And in fact, uh, this particular problem is so attractive to many people that uh, James Garfield, when he was a congressman, actually came up with his own solution to the Pythagorean theorem. Um, I don't think you know, our representatives are doing this right now. Um, <laughs> But back then, this is what our representatives were doing. I mean, I, when, you know, they, they love science, they love math, and they, he came up with his own solution. So it just gives you an idea. One of the most complicated solutions is, is shown right here, um, which essentially really requires for you to have pay attention in trigonometry, uh, algebra, geometry, and so forth, and then you work all these relationships and all this other stuff, years of schooling, and you can come up with a, with a solution. And then I was going through you know, uh, some, some documents for a while, and I found a classroom of um, middle schoolers that actually came up with a solution that is beautiful, but it required none of this knowledge. I'm going to share that with you today. It's as, as follows. They took the theorem, you know, verbatim. They're going to take the square of both sides in the hypotenuse, and they're just going to draw squares like this, A, B, and C. So the relationships are preserved. Now, if you look at triangle C, 
right here, is, is all of the other sides are also a hypotenuse. So they put triangles there, there, and there. The relationships are preserved. If you now grab those four right triangles and that square C, and you take them out of the equation, okay, to solve the equation, now you have these four triangles and C, well, you can bring all of these hypotenuses together, and the space that's left behind should really relate to the rest, and in fact it does. A fits in there, B sits in there, and you solve the Pythagorean theorem. And you didn't have to know trigonometry. You didn't have to know every single thing that you needed to know to solve this equation. So you need to think about these problems in a slightly different way if you really want to make some progress. So we thought that in, you know, a long time ago that that's what we would do. We're going to try to rethink the problem of regeneration. We're going to try to figure out ways in which we can attack this problem without necessarily having to develop this immensity list or this immense list of, 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 uh, of, of reagents and, and tools uh, to try to make some progress in our understanding. So what I'm going to do now is introduce you to the system that through a relatively long process of elimination, we decided to focus our attention on. And this is the uh, planarian uh, flatworm known as uh, Eschmitea mediterranean. So these animals are very charismatic when you look at them under the microscope. Their eyes look a little bit cockeyed, and this tube that's coming out is the pharynx. It's going into a capillary to ingest uh, some liquid food that I put in there. And so what you see essentially is that uh, this is a species, Eschmitea mediterranean, and we chose it because it shares with us and other uh, organisms a number of uh, biological attributes. Number one, they're bilaterally symmetric. Uh, they have derivatives of all three germ layers, ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. Uh, they also possess, even though they're acylomates, complex organ systems. They have a very complex central nervous system, an excretory system, body wall musculature. They're really uh, fairly um, uh, complex in their, uh, in their anatomy. And then third, fourth, uh, that they actually came already in nature as exclusively sexually reproducing and exclusively asexually reproducing animals. And the hope here was that we could conceivably begin to compare asexual reproduction to regeneration and asexual reproduction to embryogenesis to try to identify what may be similar or dissimilar between these processes to shed some light in the process of uh, regeneration. So here's what the animal looks like. Uh, this animal is approximately 15 millimeters in length. As you can see, they have four pairs of chromosomes. That was another reason for picking them. Their genome size is about the size of the first four human chromosomes, or 800 megabases. And the way they reproduce is that they are obligatory hermaphrodites. They have to exchange gametes. And then if they exchange gametes through this copulatory embrace, which lasts approximately an hour to two hours, they'll separate with each of uh, their respective uh, uh, spermatozoids and then fertilize their oocytes uh, through the next following weeks. And so after that happens, you know, you get an egg that is full with uh, yolk, and inside of that yolk, there is a sea of, uh, in that sea of yolk, there's uh, several embryos, uh, anywhere between one to eight embryos developing. And then after development proceeds, the embryos kind of look like this. They are you know, full of yolk inside. Um, you can see that right there, they're full of yolk inside. And then most of the uh, blastomeres are gonna be on the periphery of this sphere. And then through time, the animals will now develop into mini planarians. So they are direct developers. There's no larval developmental stage, okay? Another attraction in trying to uh, uh, exploit the biology of the system to understand uh, regeneration. Okay, the asexual reproducing animal is even as interesting, if not more interesting. So this animal has experienced what appears to be a Robertsonian translocation from one of the arms of chromosome one to chromosome three right here. And this jump is associated with the complete elimination of the reproductive system and the gonads. No germ cells, no ovaries, no oviducts, nothing. And so how do they reproduce? Well, the way they reproduce is that they cut themselves in half. And you're gonna see that right here. Uh, around nine o'clock, there's a planarian on the side of this petri dish. The head is pointing towards six o'clock. It's gonna crawl all the way down. It's gonna stretch out and it just pinches off like that, right? And so when that happens, you end up with a tail at around nine o'clock right there that's going to go on to regenerate the rest of the animal and a head and a trunk that will now regenerate the tail. And this is what it looks like by the time all is said and done. You get something that looks like a little uh, tail right here and the rest of the animal right here. And now you get two animals for the price of one. This is how they reproduce. They actually use regeneration to reproduce. That's a very robust system. So, uh, so regeneration in this system is truly exaggerated. And so the animals are most famous um, for the following reason, which is that you can actually splice and dice them, as, you, as, uh, as John mentioned earlier, in a number of ways, and each and every one of those fragments will actually go on to regenerate a complete animal. That's the equivalent of me cutting my little finger and watch my little finger regenerate me, 
That's what these guys do, okay? That's pretty remarkable. So if you take an animal like this, like Jochen did when he was a postdoc in the lab, and you cut it into 18 different fragments, what you get is the following. Another really good attribute of these animals, which is that each and every one of those 18 fragments ends up producing, after about a week to two weeks, 18 completely well-formed and well-behaved little planarians. It's two weeks, okay? It's not three years, it's not three months, it's two weeks. So I'm not getting any younger, so I wanna do as many parallel experiments as possible to test as many hypotheses as possible to try to get to the mechanistic uh, underpinnings of, of this process. So these animals lend themselves to this. And what is even more astonishing about this process is that this fragment right here on the side, for example, that right there, that's never made a head. So how does it know when and how and where to actually develop a head and where to put it? And yet they do this. So this is massive organogenesis from essentially random fragments. And as you can imagine, animals don't know how they're gonna get hurt. So it's not like they have a pre-existing structure that will allow them to, you know, I'm only gonna break here. Now you can cut them anywhere and they'll do this. So how is all this codified? I think that's a really important aspect of regeneration that uh, really needs to be understood. So the reason why I share all this biology with you is because it gives you an idea of how remarkably plastic, developmentally plastic these organisms are. Not only can they exist as sexually reproducing and asexually reproducing, not only can they regenerate by fission and not only can they regenerate by amputation, a lot of this plasticity is somehow codified in the genome of these animals. And the source of this plasticity has been known for quite some time to very likely reside in a very interesting population of, of cells that are known as neoblasts. Now we've known about these neoblasts for a really, really long time. Um, in fact, these are the only cells that are mitotically active in the uh, asexually reproducing animal, and so um, nothing else is dividing. And one of the first experiments that I did was to see whether or not the cells existed, so it was electromicroscopy, and it didn't take me that long to find them. So they're not rare, they're incredibly abundant, and you can see them distributed throughout the body of the organism in this little um, um, uh, green dot, which are essentially labeling cells that are under, undergoing cell division. So what do we know about neoblasts? So what we knew about neoblasts uh, uh, until this point was this, that they were first seen and reported by uh, Isao Ijima in 1884. They were turned neoblasts by a master's graduate student from Bryn Mawr College who was at the time in T.H. Morgan's department when he was chair of that department. And I think it was Harry Randolph that actually let Morgan know about the existence of these organisms because then Morgan was fascinated by them. And she referred to them as neoblasts because it reminded her of blastomeres, but they were coming from an adult animal, so, well, maybe neoblasts, okay? Um, by morphology, they correspond to about 25% of all of the cells in this animal, by morphology alone, so they're really easy to find. Uh, and they, as I mentioned, they're the only somatic cells capable of mitosis. And because of that, they can be eliminated by irradiation. Anything that breaks DNA, that, that prevents mitosis from proceeding, triggers apoptosis, and you can essentially have animals that have no stem cells at all. They eventually uh, die because as the tissues turn over, there are no neoblasts or stem cells to produce the uh, uh, post-mitotic division progeny to keep the animal intact, and they essentially just die a really ugly, uh, ugly death. But that, this is something that's been known since 1901. It was done by Bardeen and Betcher in 1901, eliminating this neoblastic irradiation. So one of the first things that we did was to try to identify molecular markers that would label these cells. <laughs> And to our surprise, we found a member of the Argonaut family, which at the time was only known as peewee, essentially expressed in every single neoblast in these animals. And initially, I thought that we had cloned Drosophila peewee because my neighbor at the Carnegie at the time was Haifan Lin, who cloned peewee in Drosophila. So I thought, I mean, these flies are everywhere. They probably came into my solution, and I cloned Drosophila peewee. I was really scared. And this was PCR sequences, so you know, you have to really stretch to get the whole sequence. But when we got the full length sequence of peewee, it was clear that it was different from Drosophila. And I was really surprised because at the time, peewee was supposed to be present only in uh, germ cells. But these are clearly not germ cells because they're producing not just one fate, they're not producing only gametes, they're producing 30 to 40 different cell types that make the anatomy of these animals. We then uh, relied on the work of David Alice, uh, who had discovered that the phosphorylated form of histone H3 at serin 10 was uh, something that occurred every time the cell traversed from G2 to mitosis, so we can now visualize uh, cells that were undergoing mitosis. And then through the work of many in the field and ourselves, we were able to begin to identify a number of markers that label many of these uh, different um, uh, uh, progenitors that ultimately give rise to all these different cell types. So even though all of these cells appear to express peewee, and even though they all appear to be um, uh, homogeneous, the identity of the progeny was really, really different and very diverse. 
And so we wanted to know when during embryogenesis do these particular cells arise? Because, um, yeah, perfect. Because um, we wanted to know, you know, if we understand the embryonic context in which these pluripotent adult stem cells arise, we should be able to use that information to understand what is it that makes potency accessible, not just for a short period of time in development, but throughout the life cycle. And what we found essentially is that even the blastomeres in the early embryos of planarians are capable of expressing multiple transcription factors that are normally exclusively associated with one or the other germ layer. So you could find blastomeres that are especially ex ex could be expressing uh, markers of mesoderm, markers of ectoderm, and endoderm. It appears as if these cells are essentially capable of expressing everything at, at once, almost like a quantum cell that is everything at once simultaneously. And this was very complicated for us to understand because we thought that you know to give rise to a bilateral organism, you have to separate these germ layers. But and I don't have time to explain this to you, but uh, this uh, uh, embryogenesis in these animals does not require epivoli and does not require gastrulation. They did not get the memo that they need to do gastrulation to be triploblastic. So they do it somehow, right? So we like to know how they do this. So the plasticity of genomic output is already there from the very beginning. And all the markers that we normally associate with the adult neoblast, they're already there in the blastomeres. So they're remnants of some embryonic process that somehow was stabilized in embryogenesis to persist and perdure all the way throughout the life cycle of the animal. So what we found out by doing transplantation experiments of blastomeres into irradiated animals is that at stages four and five is when we can identify blastomeres that when transplanted into an animal devoid of neoblast, that blastomere can actually rescue the viability and the regenerative capacity of planarians. So we know there's a time point in their, in, in their embryogenesis that these neoblasts arise. So that already suggests that there are genetic uh, regulators that are uh, essentially uh, modulating and um, affecting the way in which this potency is, um, is executed. So a few years ago, um, a past postdoctoral scientist in my lab and his then postdoctoral scientist, Josien and, and Peter Redin, um, provided us with the first line of evidence that these neoblasts were truly heterogeneous. And what they did here is that they look at, a, a, at about 96 genes in 176 cells, and these 96 genes represent, you know, markers of all these three, three germ layers, and they found that the neoblasts, all peewee positive, could be cataloged into at least three different classes. So-called sigma class, a gamma class, and zeta class. Okay? And so that allows for the first time to have a molecular definition for these cells. So now we know that they're really heterogeneous. They're all expressing peewee. They're also expressing all these other factors. But then the question is, which one of these cells really contains the, 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 the potency or, or the stem cell properties that allow planarians to do what they do. And so another experiment was done, uh, also retrospective, which is as follows, is that if we subject the animals to radiation, but it's not lethally radiation, we can actually wipe out a large number of the neoblasts, which are labeled here in, in purple with the peewee probe, such that by three days post irradiation, you essentially can count the number of surviving peewee positive cells. And if you let these animals proceed, what you see is that these cells begin to form little colonies right here, and these colonies begin to expand until eventually it repopulates the animal, and the animal now restores its ability to regenerate and its viability. So this process of uh, sublethal irradiation identify a cell type that Peter referred to as clonogenic neoblasts, because they're forming little clones in this tissue culture chamber that's the irradiated animal. The problem with this experiment is that even though it allows us to, uh, to know that such cells exist, we could not really know which cells of, of the 25% uh, of neoblasts would be the cells that we wanted to do. So David Wagner, he was a graduate student in Peter's lab, and, uh, and Peter did the following experiment, which I, I really think is a particularly heroic experiment to do. Because what they did essentially is that they purified individual cells, transplanted those individual cells into lethally irradiated animals in this particular location, and then asked, can this cell proliferate and restore the viability? They refer to these cells as clonogenic neoblasts to you know, represent the ones that I showed you earlier by the sublethal irradiation. But here's the rub, is that it took 123 injections to get one of these cells to rescue the animal. I don't know about you, but if I were a graduate student, by injection 120, I would have given up. I mean, quite frankly. But they just kept on going because the data suggested that it was possible to identify these cell populations. So this provided us then with the really, really good evidence that there is a stem cell type or a stem cell a state that, is, that exists in this organism that allows for um, the potency to be uh, manifested. 
But the problem with this particular problem, uh, the problem with this particular situation is that it created a, um, a paradox, and a, 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 a dichotomy, in that we have an operational definition for these neoblasts, which are these clonogenic neoblasts, and we have a molecular definition, which is you know, referred to the cells. But in both of these cases, the cells are dead. So it's entirely retrospective. So we didn't know which cell is which. Which cell is a C neoblast? And so what we decided to do was to try to bridge that, that dichotomy and try to identify a way to prospectively identify these cells and begin to study their functions. So we noticed, uh, as technology improves, that uh, we can actually now measure individual transcripts being uh, uh, made and being present in the cytoplasm of cells that when we label the neoblast with peewee and we looked at single molecular resolution in situ, we noticed that these neoblasts were not all evenly labeled that there were actually differences in the levels of expression within the peewee uh, positive cells. So this provided us with a quantitative and unbiased way to begin to bend or differentiate the neoblast with this particular marker. And so when we do this, and we ran the, uh, the, uh, the, um, uh, the flow cytometry by either low or very high levels of peewee expression, we find that the cells are somewhat similar, but they could really be sorted out into either high peewee expressors and low peewee expressors. We develop an antibody against P1 and ask the question, is the protein behaving the same way or not? And when we do that, what we find is that, in fact, high levels of P expression are accompanied by high levels of protein uh, being translated, and low levels of P expression have accompanying low levels of P protein, which then allows us to really be able to sort these cells out into very high P expressors and relatively low P expressors. And the hypothesis is that maybe the clonogenic neoblasts are going to be in the high P expressors. It's just a hypothesis. So we decided to test that. And the way we did that is that we can now purify the high PU expressors, and then we can subject thousands of these cells to single cell sequencing in the hopes of identifying which cells really are the ones that do what they do. And here's uh, the uh, 7,000, close to 7,500 uh, 7, cells that were sequenced. In orange is the signal of PW showing that there's relatively high PW expression in all of these cells. Uh, but the surprise came when we asked the uh, software to tell us how many different clusters of cell types may pr be present in this. And it turned out that we were able to identify from what appeared to be a homogeneous, high level of expression P with cells, at least 12 different clusters. This was a surprise. Um, and so we ask, okay, can we really sort out which ones have the most P with expression and which have the few P with expression and just focus on the one that have the most P with expression. So we decided to focus on these particular clusters right here, <coughs> clusters one all the way down to uh, eight or so, okay? All right, so now we can ask, are, do these clusters, are they real or are they memorex? I mean, are they really bioinformatics uh, artifacts or do they really correspond to biological activity present in the animals? And so what we did is that we look at each and every one of these clusters, identify specific uh, genes associated with these clusters, and then did in situ hybridization to show that in fact what we're seeing is that they do exist. That you have a lot of like peewee positive cells in green right here, but not all of them are expressing in this case HNF4 or the PAL23 uh, transcription factor is in just a subset of cells that give rise to the excretory system, but a lot of green cells that are PW positive are negative for this gene. So each and every one of these particular categories was verified by in situ hybridizations, and then when we distributed the numbers of cells each in each of these clusters with the quantifiable in situ hybridizations, we noticed that the first three categories really corresponded to what we were seeing biologically. So we decided to focus on these three uh, categories right here, MB1, MB2, and MB3. So when we look at these categories, it became readily apparent that MB2 we have never seen before. It's this population of, of, uh, of cells that is present right here in, in, this, in this cluster, but for which we have never seen any markers described in the literature before. So we thought we should look at this a little bit more closely. And so we were asked by reviewer number three to do a pseudo time analysis of this, uh, 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 these studies to find out which would be the most primitive stem cell. I think these experiments are flawed because it's really a snapshot. It's really difficult to make forecasts from a single picture. You can go either way. Uh, but uh, what turned out to be the case is that after this analysis that perhaps the most primitive and the most undifferentiated uh, cell type based on the markets that were available was this MB2 population shown right here, which is really essentially at the base of this uh, pseudomap uh, rotation that you're seeing right here. So we took these cells and uh, identified a few markers, some of which uh, we have never used before and we have never described before, and asked, are they really expressed in neoblasts? So we do the same experiment with peewee and these three markers, and we found that, in fact, 
they are expressing some of these PV positive cells, which you can see right there. And then if they are really neoblast, um, they should be expressed you know, uh, broadly. This is one market that works really well, TGS1, but it should disappear if you irradiate the animal. And in fact, many, if not all of the cells essentially went away, suggesting that it is expressed in this dividing and proliferating neoplasm. Okay, so that was encouraging. But then we decided to do the experiment that would prove the hypothesis wrong, which was that if in fact these cells are clonogenic neoblasts, we should see these markers in clonogenic neoblasts. So we did the experiment. We subjected the animals to sublethal irradiation. And essentially what we did is that by day seven, you can see expression of peewee here. By day seven, that expression is essentially gone. We took animals at day seven. There are very few neoblasts by, by peewee expression. Um, and then um, sorted the cells and, and then removed cells that we know are present in the, uh, in, in the dividing cells, which would be the neoblasts, and then non-dividing cells, and then sequenced as many as the budget could afford, which was about 1,000 cells or so. And so what we have essentially is now a new map, okay, of the cells that survive post-lethal irradiation. And we suspect that in these islands, there should be a peewee positive cell population. So we ask which one of these cell populations has peewee, and we find this population in the middle has expression of uh, SMET we one or peewee one right there. And now we can ask, do these cells contain the markers for NB2, which we characterized in the previous slides? And when we do that, that's exactly what we found. So now we know that this NB2 population is expressing genes that are expressed in the clonogenic neoblasts that survive after sublethal irradiation. It's this group of cells here. We corresponded to about 28 cells out of like the 1,200 cells. It's like finding a needle in a, in a needle stack. But that's the beautiful thing about uh, technology these days. So then we ask, in this list of genes that represent the MB2 population, are there any membrane-associated genes that we could use to try to raise antibodies to try to purify these cells? And we found several. And the one that we were most struck by was this member of the tetraspanning family of proteins, which we refer to as tetraspanning one. And as you all know, this is a very large uh, family of molecules. You and I in our genome have about 30 or 40 different tetraspannings. And they're very difficult to study. But we also knew from the literature that some of the early antibodies that were generated to isolate hematopoietic stem cells turned out to be codifying for tetraspanics. So we're very encouraged by this. And we thought, well, let's look at the literature. And the literature told us which domain of the tetraspanics we should derive an oligonucleotide to raise the antibody against. So we took that information and then generated an antibody. Um, so what I'm going to show you now is you know, what does the tetraspanic signal look like? Uh, before you know, we, we test it with the antibodies. And we see, for example, this expression is actually really, really low. You can barely detect it in uh, intact animals right here. But its expression increases immediately after amputation. By one day's post-amputation, you can see it. By two days post-amputation, it's per fairly clear, suggesting that this is a rare population of, of cells expressing this particular marker. And then it is ex also expressed in peewee positive cells. So here's the antibody experiments that I just mentioned. So we developed the antibody, and then we tried to purify cells with just the antibody and then a secondary antibody to identify the uh, anti tetraspanning antibody. And you can see essentially that there is a window that contains events of tetraspanning positive uh, cells. And we purify them and this is what we got. We got live cells that appear to be labeled with these uh, antibodies, which you can see right here. Uh, you can see these little cells uh, present there. Not all of them, but many of them were uh, tetraspanning positive. And so because they're alive, we can look at them. And I'm gonna let the cat out of the bag but this cell we followed. So we got this live cell and we injected it back into an irradiated animal. And I can tell you this cell actually gave rise and rescue complete animals. You're looking at an adult pluripotent stem cell in all of its glory. This cell can codify everything that Panerians can make. I mean, I couldn't believe it when we got these results. And I've never seen, for example, these processes that are being, um, you know, uh, spreading out from the cell proper. I mean, we have never seen that at all. They're not fixing well when we fix them. So the biology and the cell biology associated with these cells is also fairly unknown, if not completely unknown. So it opens new opportunities for us to pursue a cell biology in, in these organisms. So here's the experiment that we did. We repeated Peter's experiment and Dave Wagner's experiment. We purified cells the same way they did it. We confirmed that, in fact, it takes about 123 injections to get a few animals to be rescued. And then we purified these tetraspanning positive cells and did the same experiment. We would inject a single cell. And so one of the advantages of being able to label these cells with the secondary fluorescent antibodies is that you can actually see the single cell being injected. So that's a single cell uh, of a tetraspanning positive cell injected in this region of the animal right there. And so it's really just one cell in a sea of differentiated cells. 
And now we can ask, do these cells rescue? And so we can see that they begin to proliferate. They're positive with the uh, uh, H3P uh, antibody. We can see that they are dividing. We can see that they give rise to colonies. Essentially, by 10 days post-transplantation, the numbers have increased from one to many. And so if we now follow these animals after multiple injections, what we see is that we're able to rescue many animals by doing this transplantation. And our yields are a little bit better. It's about 36 out of 144 injections, or close to 25% of the transplantation experiments, were positive for this type of, of rescue. So this is the type of gain that we actually you know, will take. Because we were at 0.8% before, we're now at about 25%. That is a 30-fold increase in our ability to interrogate this biology. So for now, we're going to take it. As to why the other 75% didn't work, there are hypotheses, many hypotheses to try to get to that. And uh, I'd like to discuss those with you um, in, in a couple of minutes. So why do I want to discuss that with you? Because if you were paying attention, and I told you that you can take you know, a little fragment from any part of the animal, and that fragment can regenerate a, 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 a complete animal, the odds of you being able to trap one of these tetraspanning positive cells are very low. So this experiment should fail a lot, and it doesn't. Every single fragment, every time we cut, we get the right number of organisms out of the right number of fragments. And so I've been thinking for quite some time now that maybe we need to rethink the way we think about um, uh, stem cells. And this is the model that most of us uh, uh, love and appreciate, that there is a stem cell population, uh, that that stem cell population self-renew, and it produces progeny that will go on to be specified and determined and differentiated into specific cell types. And whenever there is a change to homeostasis, then you get the sufficient uh, self-renewal and the sufficient production of division progeny to regain homeostasis. And I refer to this model as the deterministic model. The stem cell exists as a unit somewhere in the animal. It's being maintained in a niche, and that's perfectly fine. But all of these results, without fail, can also be interpreted by using a different model, which is what I refer to as the probabilistic model, which is essentially that you might have one cell that is expressing marker X at one point, shuts it off, and turns marker Y, the same cell, later on, and keeps on going in some sort of probabilistic manner. And this is representing the entire population. I think the deterministic model is in place because of the way we purify stem cells. We usually purify them by flow cytometry, and we interrogate what they're expressing. But we really don't know what the cells are actually expressing as a whole in the intact animal. So the corollaries from this type of, uh, of a hypothesis is that the event of cell renewal now becomes a conceptual property that is not possessed by a discrete population. At this moment, this cell can self-renew, but if it exits that particular state, it'll go uh, to a different state. Another cell that now assumes that state can self-renew. So the population is not really determined. It's really represented. It's an emergent property of the population of cells. Secondly, if it's transiently held by a small number of cells that are arising probabilistically, that may explain why we don't see a lot of these cells in, in the population. And it really depends on the demands of the animal. And I think for regeneration, this is very important because the animal doesn't know how it's going to get hurt. It doesn't know how many of these pluripotent cells really will have to have at any time. And it has to have a way to increase their numbers in some fashion such that irrespective of the geometry and the type of amputation, you get what you need to get. So this injury will actually induce changes in the frequency and periodicity of expression of this particular uh, genomic output to actually result in an altered distribution of progeny to restore the form and function of this animal. So we thought that we could use the single cell data sequence that we obtained to sort of test this hypothesis. And so what we did essentially was to ask the following question. If we now purify neoblasts from at least three different biological contexts, and we purify the tetraspanning positive cells, will their genomic outputs be the same, or would they differ between each other? So we already show you the single cell data for the sublethally irradiated animals, and I show you the, uh, the single cell sequence data for the uh, homeostatic uh, organism. So, uh, so here what we did is that we cut a small fragment of the animal, and then three days post-amputation, uh, we uh, purify the cells and ask, what do the MB2 positive cells look like here? And so when we do that and compare those experiments, this is what we get. So these are all in blue and zero because this is the reference mark. These are all these, the, the genes that are expressed in the MB2 or tetraspanning positive cells. And now we ask, what do those genes look like in these cells in repopulation and regeneration? And you can see that they're different between each other. So even the cells themselves can actually exist in different transcriptional states. I like to understand how that is being regulated. How that stuff is being sorted out such that it knows when to repopulate and when to regenerate is an important question that I think we need to understand in order for us to understand why some organisms can regenerate and others cannot. 
So this opens a, a great deal of opportunities for us. And so now that we can purify these cells, can we culture these things? And so if we could, then you know, it'll be fantastic. And so it turns out that we can for a short period of time. I'm gonna show you right now for the first time, neoblast undergoing cell division in a Petri dish. We've never seen this before. So we now have access to this biology in a Petri dish where we can really begin to interrogate what these cells may or may not be doing and how they may be behaving. It turns out that the vast majority of the cell divisions appear to be asymmetric in nature. We don't understand why. Our culture conditions are such that you know, uh, they're very primitive. We have identified, a, and you can just see the cell dividing here with a DNA dye. It's real cell division. That's reviewer number three. Um, and then you can see here that uh, we can take these cells in these different um, uh, 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 conditions, and we can actually see that they retain their potency uh, one day, two days, and three days post-culture. So some culture media work better than others. Three days is an eternity. I mean, three days is essentially one-third of all of regeneration that takes place, if not half of regeneration that takes place. So we should be able to utilize these cells, manipulate them, and then put them back in the animal and begin to ask very, very specific questions about um, how this um, cellular agent is capable of um, triggering a regenerative response in, uh, in planarians proper. Okay, so I'm gonna conclude what I just told you uh, with the following. Um, we think that these uh, piggy positive cells, these neoblasts, are vastly more heterogeneous than anybody had anticipated. We knew they were heterogeneous, but even the very high piggy expressors are themselves very heterogeneous. Um, we uh, think now that it is possible for us to purify live planogenic neoblasts for the first time, which opens a great deal of opportunities for us to expand our understanding of this process. And that we now have perhaps you know, the first line of evidence that transcriptional plasticity is occurring in these neoblasts. And this is something we had not anticipated, but it seems to be happening. And I think to really resolve those questions, we're really gonna have to follow the transcriptional profile of the same cell through time. And for that, we're gonna have to develop uh, a new methodology which we are in the, uh, in the thicket of trying to figure out how to do. Um, and then this prospective isolation of these adult pluripotent stem cells will allow us to do some of the things I show you. A detailed characterization of the CNEOblast genomic output, how is that stuff being regulated uh, at the single cell level? Uh, and then of course, do systematic cell culture to try to introduce technologies like CRISPR-Cas9 and other things that we really need uh, to uh, continue to interrogate uh, uh, this biology. So I just wanna thank the people that uh, make this uh, work possible. And so um, there are many, all of them contributed to this, uh, but the work on the single cell biology was done by this very serious and solemn looking uh, postdoctoral scientist, Anne Zhang, and the work on tissue culture was done by um, uh, Kai Lei, who is now a faculty member at Westlake University, it's the first private university in, in China, very proud of him and everybody else here, uh, because uh, it really, uh, they contribute intellectually in ways that are really hard to uh, measure. And then of course the funding agencies and particularly NIGMS, who as John mentioned to you, they've been, uh, you guys have been funding my research for the past uh, 20 years. And with that, I'll conclude and I'll take any questions if, if you have any. Thanks very much. Thank you, Alejandro, for that fantastic talk. And the floor is open for questions. If you could come up to the mics. Here's one over here. Uh, have you ever thought of creating some type of a chimera, either by an embryo or some other animal, to see if you could get some, probably at the embryonic level, some type of a fusion with an embryo with those cells, to see if you, you could create, for example, another animal that could regenerate? Yeah, no, we have not tried. We have discussed this, um, this line of experimentation, and uh, this is work that um, uh, uh, the postdoctoral fellow, Erin Davis, that is working on um, embryogenesis of planarians would like to do at some time. It's not just making chimeras, but also uh, executing a lot of heterotopic and heterochronic transplantations to identify first, you know, what are the necessary conditions that allow these cells to do what they do, and then in due course, one should be able to identify organisms, pla other planarians, that are really bad at regeneration, and they do exist, and then begin to do the kinds of chimeras that you're mentioning, such that you can narrow down what individual factors may, know, may or may not be responsible for this type of, uh, of activity. So I think these are really good experiments, but, but we have not done uh, those yet. And I hope that Erin, when she establishes her own lab, will be able to do those experiments, and maybe she can tell you all about it. Uh, thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, hi. Hey, uh, Raja. So uh, I was wondering, you had you suggested two options in terms of the uh, behavior and fate of the uh, neoblast, a deterministic model or a probabilistic model. Mm -hmm. What about the possibility of spatial information? So the yeah. uh, context in which it is found. So for example, when you eliminate them and they start repopulating and the clone grows, yeah. if you now test the potential of a central cell which is surrounded in a dead thing versus at the edge. Yeah, that, that's very perceptive. I mean, we think that that's part of the problem as well. And we think that the only way that could happen is if there is a distribution across the anatomy of the animal, a particular cell type or cell types that would allow for generating that uh, environment in which these cells could, or this probabilistic thing could occur. So what we did was that we took our tetraspanning positive cells, we did an in situ with these things, and then uh, since the animals are flat, we quantify all of them, and then we mark uh, with other markers associated with the anatomy of the animal, and then counted if there was any non-random distribution of these tetraspanning positive cells. And what we find is that tetraspanning positive cells have a much higher tendency to be at the very tip of the branches of the, of the gut than anywhere else. Cool. What we don't know is if that they're coming in or out, or they have to always be there and just be deterministic in that particular case. We don't think it's deterministic because of this amputation experiment, but it might be that there is a place where the probabilities are much higher right. for those cells to become bad. And so Ann and, and, and others in the lab are trying to essentially sort that out right now. Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you. Thanks, Ajay. So <clears throat> you covered these uh, animals for such a long time, and you know the genomes, and you found out the cells which have the ability to grow from single cell. Mm -hmm. So is there anything in their genome that helps us to identify this potential for regeneration? In what sense? I mean, these cells from one cell, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you have the ability to grow the whole animal. Right. So the question is, what is it in their genome okay. that we are missing? Yeah. No, I don't know. I mean, that's the, uh, you know, that's a $10 million question in, in today's dollars, I guess. But I mean, I don't know. I mean, what I can tell you is this, is that if you remember the electron micrograph that I show you, uh, there's very little electron dense material in the nucleus. So the chromatin is highly decondensed, highly decondensed. There's very little heterochromatic islands in that, in, that, in that chromatin. So how do these organisms, you know, don't turn on everything at once since all of the chromatin is accessible? That's an important question. Now we have some lines of evidence to suggest using um, uh, RNAi against SET1 and MLL1, which are um, uh, um, acetylators of uh, histone H3, K4 trimethylation, that um, they actually exist in different states, in the sense that MLL1 will actually label uh, exclusively the transcription star site of genes, but there is no transcription, and the transcription is activated when the cells differentiate and migrate to the specific tissues, whereas SET1 uh, is actually marking the entire locus of the genes that are expressed in neoblasts. So there is some epigenetic regulation that is differential that is taking place in these cells. What we don't have, however, is single cell resolution. So we're looking at averages of millions of cells. So it's really hard to know what may be the actual combinations that allow for these types of things. So what we would like to see at some point is to go back and take now these tetraspanning positive cells, purify as many of those as we can, and then repeat these experiments in the hope that we have reduced now a great deal of, it, of the uh, heterogeneity to try to identify are there any specific aspects of the way in which they're regulating the genomic output that um, make these cells, you know, pluripotent, if not totipotent, throughout their existence. But the, the, the simple question, the simple answer to your question is that no, we don't know. Uh, we really don't know. So what is the smallest cut you could have where the regenerative potential will not be there? Yeah, that's a great question as well. So um, postdoctoral scientists in the lab, um, Blair, Benham Pyle, is addressing that question. And uh, it's based on experiments that were carried out by T.H. Morgan in 1901 where he determined that a fragment that is one over 279th the size of the whole animal can restore a complete animal. In modern terms, what that means is essentially a plug of approximately 0.5 millimeters in diameter, which consists of approximately 6,000 cells or so. So there's enough information and enough cells in such a uh, plug of tissue to restore uh, and, and launch a, a complete regenera uh, regeneration response. 
All right, so we should be able to regenerate someday ourselves, any hope? Yeah, maybe, yeah, we will see, yeah, it would be nice, it would be nice, yeah. Hi, that was a beautiful talk. So Thank you. I have a question. Um, so is it a matter of cell type or cell state? Mm -hmm. And in that, uh, in that sense, if you were, I don't know if it's possible, if you were to take out this T-spine positive uh, cell or enriched in T-spine, would the animal age or show aging type of phenotype? Yeah, so that's a really, really good question. And so this is one of the things that these um, research organisms, you know, uh, push you to think about, right? Um, yes, I, I, yeah, because um, I'm going from a mammal's perspective of, you know, cells, stem cell is a type. Right, um, that's right. And so, so here's what I think. I, mean, I don't know if this is correct or not, but this is what I think. And so what I think is that um, these cells are really entering and exiting a particular state, depending on what the demands are. That can be tested experimentally and proven wrong if necessary. Um, but what I think is happening is even more profound than that. And that is that um, we tend to associate in an indivisible way biological time with astronomical time. And I don't think they have to go together. So what these cells may have figured a way of doing is to retain a biological time locked in a particular state of undifferentiation that's independent of astronomical time. All of these ones that I show you, okay, every single one of them, the, the millions that we've cut and analyzed and studied, they all came from one animal, okay, one animal, okay? And so that means that, you know, they've been aging for 20 years, right? And so if you have a cell that's only undergoing uh, cell division through mitosis, and there's no meiosis, and there's no recombination. Every time, and I show you, the cells are dividing all the time, right? So every time they divide, every individual cell, which is really the unit of selection here, it's not the animal, it's the cell because they're pluripotent, they can make a different mistake, every single one of them, right? So what that means essentially is that you'll have a very heterogeneous genotype in all of these cells, and some of those errors will result in something that is bad for the animal, and since there is no recombination, the only DNA repair mechanisms that we are aware of at the present time that exist for a mitotically dividing cell are orthodox methods of DNA repair. So you would get essentially, you know, gene replacement. I mean, you, you essentially just would get homozygosity through and through. And I can tell you right now, the genome is not homozygous. Mm -hmm. So they figure a way to retain this. So that's a mysterious thing. We don't know how they do it. Uh, and it would be really, really nice to understand how they do it. So the aging part is how you look at it. Now, if you stop being a neoblast, yes, your, your days are counted because you will have a half-life after which you'll undergo apoptosis and then be replaced by freshly minted progeny from the neoblast. But for the neoblast itself, to be able to perpetuate itself and the, the population, I mean, I don't know how to explain that. I mean, we, what I think we understand Do about Do they have process. any difference? So, sorry, I'm just going to one more question. In okay. the uh, mitochondria, in the way that they uh, yeah, so we haven't looked at that, okay. okay? We haven't looked at that. And so that, that's, that's, a, that's a, a favorite hypothesis right now in some members of the lab because we have been able to see an asymmetric distribution of mitochondrial numbers. Right. Uh, and or we don't accumulation of mutation. That's right. And we also have noticed that the mitochondria can exist as individual or as fused. And there's mm -hmm. evidence from uh, the hematopoietic field that activation of natural killer cells mm -hmm. makes that transition from oxfos to... Uh, glycolysis, et cetera. Uh, so yeah, these are possibilities, but you know, no experiments yet. Okay. Awesome, thank Great. you. Great, thank you. So I guess this should inspire us to study the other 99.9991% yes. of <laughs> biology, correct. right? Yes. So thank you so much for yeah. a fantastic talk. Thank you. Thanks very much.